that you've sent to us are, are here for reference. Um, and the, the first part of this talk is gonna consist of introductions by the artists themselves. Um, and uh, I just wanna reiterate to keep, to keep these introductions as brief as possible, about five minutes or so. But we're most interested uh, to know about your location, where you work from, uh, the city, and if Los Angeles or California has always been your home. Uh, the mediums of choice, your school and uh, career path, and then the year or time that you emerged. And, and Wayne, your position in the show is a little bit differently, so when we get to you, I'll, I'll reiterate the questions that I have for you. So we'd like to start with Phyllis. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Phyllis. And um, I moved to Southern California in 1979. And I lived previously in Vancouver, British Columbia. I came here to be a graduate student in art. Can I look at the questions? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm a sculptor. I, I have a, my MFA is actually in ceramics, but I and, I, and the pieces I have on this show are ceramic, but I, I do mixed media pieces, really. I also have done um, video um, and performance, but I consider myself a sculptor, mainly. I graduated from the MFA program at UCLA in 1981, and I consider that my professional career started after that. So I actually went back to Vancouver for a year to teach when I got my MFA, and then I came back here, and I've been here ever since, since which is since uh, 83. And um, how did I connect with Wayne? I was trying to think of that. Wayne and I have had a mutual friend, and I think I met Wayne through him a long time ago, but I feel like I've known Wayne for so long now that I can't quite remember. <laughs> Is that right? Did we meet through Don? Okay. Sort of foggy in my memory. Yeah, yeah. You and uh, Don. That's right, that's right. That's right. Okay. Okay, yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Hung Viet Nguyen. Uh, I, I was born in Vietnam. And uh, right now I work and live in the city of Torrance. It's about 17 miles uh, from downtown LA. And when I came here, uh, my background is uh, I study biology. Uh, in Vietnam, but when I come here in 1981, 82, and I start change my career, so I work as to be like illustrator and graphic artist. And that's the that the career I love to to work to making uh, making living and also do my fine painting whenever I have time. And five years ago, I totally devote my time for painting. Uh, and uh, for um, like many artists, uh, I always love to draw and paint, uh, create artwork. But the change 
for me to emerge the art scene is uh, actually year 2000. I'm kind of new. Uh, by the time I'm, I'm create more, I paint more, and I'm looking for the play to exhibit uh, my work. And, and I know when, uh, actually, I didn't know him before, but I have some couple of show, I think, in LA, and uh, when come to see the show, and, and he sent me uh, an email and uh, offered me to a studio visit, and uh, also taking a picture. And when I study more about when and see when he'd been taking a picture at very famous art in LA. And for me, that's a great honor uh, to, to, to be included in the project and also to be shown in, uh, uh, in that museum. Hello, I'm Monique Prieto. Um, I am a, a native Los Angelina. <laughs> uh, um, my grandparents were all born in Mexico. I'm a third generation Mexican American. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I started out at LACC, um, transferred to UCLA, moved to New York for a year and a half to see what that was like, came back to Los Angeles because I missed it. Um, went to CalArts and, um, and became um, an actual exhibiting artist in 1994, 95, um, and have been doing that since. I work primarily in paint, um, but I do a lot of other stuff too, um, sculpture and um, installation have done recently, and a lot of stuff with sewing recently too. But, um, and I think that um, Wayne and I became acquainted maybe sometime in 2012 or 2013, I want to say. I'm not sure what Oh, so if I was at, still at Acme, then it would have been pre-2011. Um, um, and he introduced himself at a show um, and, you know, just such a nice person and asked if he could come to my studio sometime. And, and I was really happy to to have him come by um, and um, he took pictures and it was really fun and comfortable and I, I really liked that he had this ongoing project, like really ongoing, um, and to be part of it was really a thrill. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Um, I, I wrote three pages. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's eight minutes long, so I'm not gonna use it, uh, but uh, just uh, you see my name out there. That's my professional name. Is this really on? No. I don't think they're on. Before it was. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's on. Uh, so I, I was born in Iran, uh, and my family. Uh, there we go. It's on. And my family. Uh, moved to Los Angeles in 1971. I went to high school uh, in the South Bay Area. I uh, went to graduate school at Claremont uh, Graduate University and uh, received my MFA in painting in 1988. Uh, I thought I would be speaking with my images in the background, so. Uh, there we go. Oh yeah, so this is a work it's about three meters by five meters, and it's from 1989 when I first began combining sculpture and painting. It's a piece I did in Prague, uh, and uh, that's when Czechoslovakia was still a communist country. Uh, anyway, I'm a multimedia artist, and uh, uh, the piece I have in the exhibit here uh, Wayne chose, uh, it was my Vietnam exhibit, and they're just uh, video uh, pieces. Uh, one's a video performance by myself, and the other one I captured in Saigon, uh, and uh, recently was made into a diptych, but originally two-channel projection. Uh, I live and work in LA. Uh, I will go more into the other stuff, I didn't think 
I don't know, do we get to come back to the images and we, speak we with them? We can go to the other ones. Oh, so you have them spread out? We have them a little spread out. Oh. Yeah. Um, we want I, have, I have three images. One shows my more recent paintings of the last 10 years. Uh, and then the final image is the final portrait that Wayne shot of me with my most recent work. Uh, which shows the combining of sculpture and painting. Uh, so the sculptures in this case emerged from the paintings and they're in conversation with the painting. Because as you can see, uh, they're flipped, so they're not seen as a cast shadow uh, onto the painting, but that they're the same protagonists, but they're conversing with each other. And it's stuff that you can ask me about if you like. I met Wayne. In the early aughts, uh, I've been running an exhibition space in LA for 24 years, which is now uh, complete. Uh, I'm working on archiving um, materials and its future books. Uh, Wayne was introduced to me through Susan Joseph. Uh, I'm not sure if she worked out here as a curator, but uh, she, she did introduced us and Wayne came and took the first photo that's in the exhibit and it's a very special one that he couldn't do without so he didn't use my new one. Uh, that one I'm standing on top of the edge of an elevator and you know he did a lot of fancy Photoshop work that maybe he can talk about. It's also black and white. It's very cool. So uh, I have a lot I can tell you. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Blue, and we can pick up later. Thanks, Habib. Yeah. I'm Blue McWright. Um, I live in and work in Venice. It, I've lived in Venice since 1985. I moved there from Santa Fe, New Mexico. But I've lived all over the place. But um, I lived in Santa Fe about 10 years before I moved to um, Los Angeles. And I mostly, uh, in my practice, is mostly sculpture and installation and drawing, although I started as a painter and did that for quite a number of years before I, um, I started getting a lot of public art commissions and working with uh, that kind of three-dimensional space awakened in me my uh, desire to do more sculpture, and now that's pretty much all I do. I went to Rhode Island School of Design and the Evergreen State College uh, before I decided that my true passion was to be a working artist. And so I started showing in galleries and working as a wilderness guide and ski instructor in those days to support myself. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, not the wilderness guide part anymore because that's hard when you're in Los <coughs> Angeles. but. Um, so that was my background. It's a pretty unorthodox background for uh, practicing artists in Los Angeles. But it makes me who I am as an artist. The tension between nature and culture has always been a big part of my life and part of my work. Um, I met Wayne a few years ago and it, through Phyllis. She introduced no, us. It wasn't? Patty. It was a Patty's? make that more than a few years ago <laughs> when I was showing at Patricia Farr Gallery. Now I remember. Anyway, I knew Wayne's work before we actually met and really admired it and admired him and I saw him everywhere and um, was really glad when we finally connected and Wayne came to my studio for the first of two times to do photographs and we really hit it off. And uh, here I am. Thank you for including me. Well, thanks for being included. Thanks. I'm the photographer of all of these guys, and that is a real privilege, I think. Um, I'm from LA, um, grew up in the same neighborhood that my mother grew up in, so I know LA very well. And um, grew up near the Southwest Museum, where both Carlos Amras and Elsa Flores Amras has, have a painting of. So those two paintings mean a great deal to me. I went north to school at first at UC Santa Cruz and then came back to UCLA because they had a, a working art department. Santa Cruz at that time, I think, had about two or 3,000 students that were just pulling it together. 
and um, studied. Uh, I was in the studio art department there, and at that time, uh, they were really big on multimedia work, so I explored a lot of that. As, but my real interest was painting, and I kind of put that aside while I was at school because there were so many other distractions. And then after I got out of school, I kind of uh, worked in art departments, and uh, a lot of kids from the colleges, uh, the art schools, worked at the Apparel News, so I uh, met a lot of the artists, like, uh, well, uh, just the whole host of artists uh, that worked there, and um, started using the camera just to document, uh, uh, using it as a journal. And uh, so a lot of the portraits uh, this project started uh, photographing my friends, and then as they were artists, it just expanded from there. And uh, when I was introduced to photography, uh, there was a very strict school uh, that I was introduced to, was to shoot with a 35 millimeter camera, uh, compose the entire photograph through the lens, and uh, develop it in the dark room. So that's where I started, and over the years, I got very interested in uh, digital photography color. And uh, it really opened me up to more of the background, uh, educational background that I had. And prior to that, I um, studied ceramics in high school. And there were a lot of uh, places like Otis and um, the Junior Art Center that had a lot of programs for kids. So that was really useful for kids growing up in LA. And that's how this all got started. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Um, so now this, the second part of the panel is more of a conversation. And uh, we have a few topics that we're interested in discussing. Um, the first being, and I, I think for San Bernardino, I think this is very interesting because it's, uh, it's a center that doesn't necessarily have a flourishing art scene. Um, and we are making attempts to change that. Uh, but we're interested in knowing what was the, the California art scene like when you were emerging as artists and if you can pull from your memory and describe a little bit of what that scene was like. Well, I could start again. Mm -hmm. I, um, I came from Vancouver and even though relative to today the um, art scene was small, it was huge to me. And there was a, a big contemporary, um, well, there was a contemporary art uh, community. And it was mostly centered around Venice. I mean, Venice was the, the happening place then. I'm talking about the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, when I, I came here, as I said, to be a grad student at UCLA, and I got a job, a work-study job with Laddie John Dill, who was one of the artists who was really prominent in that Venice group. And so I got a chance to find out more about the art scene in LA than I would have by just going to classes at UCLA. So that was interesting to me. And there were, you know, at that time, maybe four or five areas in LA where there were galleries. One of them, and I mean by areas, I mean there was maybe three on Venice Boulevard. There were some on Santa Monica Boulevard. There were still some on La Cienega, although that scene was waning um, by the time I got here. Um, and there were a lot of art schools. So that was the way that people connected, it seemed to me. That is not the professionals, but there were a lot of students going to art schools that were all over the place. So that was a big factor in the LA art scene and made it made it interesting. There was also the LA County Museum, um, no mocha, um, and at the end of the time I was in grad school, the uh, downtown art scene was developing. And so after I graduated from UCLA and and went I went to Vancouver, as I said, for a year, came back and I moved to downtown LA, which was really um, and there were a lot of artists living there. There were a lot of buildings being renovated and the studios relative to today were really cheap. So that's what I remember about the late 1970s, early 80s. Yeah, and uh, Kyle, um, 
I'm kind of uh, new to the art scene because I just started you know, on year 2000. So I think it's just roughly 20 years. And not much, you know, but uh, I can see some difference uh, because the technology and the internet uh, uh, get improved. So uh, the artists now, it, mm, sometimes they don't depend much on the gallery uh, because sometimes it's hard to get into the gallery. So I can see the artists, they can do some kind of self-promotion uh, and they do whatever they can to be like that, but uh, I just uh, remind you that few uh, it very com uh, competitive. Uh, we have uh, every year we have the student graduate from school all over the country. Uh, we have the artists like us. We don't retire. Uh, we never retire. So you know you're gonna we still here for a long time. You know, and also uh, uh, also the group of the people I'm talking about retiree. Uh, they have passion in art, but they've been working, and now they have. When they retire, they have a lot of time, and maybe they have money too. So they can be a very, uh, very group of work, you know, to be compete with. Uh, that's what I can see, you know. And also one thing I can see, you know, like in California and also the big city, we have the artists from around the world come here to looking for the opportunity, and that the field is really uh, very competitive. So uh, if you guys take a fire arc, you know, be prepared for that. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I finished my studies at UCLA with my BFA, I think, in 1987. And, um, and I, I, I hadn't thought about what I was going to do next. Um, and an opportunity came to go live in a basement in New York. And at that time, in the 80s, there was still the idea that that was the better place to be an artist. So I went there, and um, I got on a train with 13 boxes. And, um, and I tried it out for a year and a half, about I made it. Um, and it was a hard life, but really fun. Um, it's not, uh, it was a lot cheaper then, but still way expensive compared to Los Angeles. Um, but being an artist in New York at that time with only a BFA was pretty challenging. I wasn't really making art. I was just having a job and trying to get by day by day. I really missed Los Angeles. I couldn't get tortillas over there, and it was really rough. I mean, I'm sure it's different now, but <laughs> back then you couldn't get one. Um, uh, I came back to Los Angeles just because I had an opportunity to have a job back here, and I was running out of money there. And so I, that's when I decided to go back to school, and, um, and I miraculously got into CalArts not knowing what I was getting myself into. And um, uh, I uh, finished that in 1994. Um, and so um, having tried being an artist in New York, I, I wasn't at all feeling compelled to go back there um, with my MFA. And um, coincidentally, not knowing that anything good was going to come of having studied art. I also had gotten married in my senior year and was already pregnant with my first baby by the time I graduated in May of 1994. Um, so I wasn't really trying really hard to <laughs> make something happen. But things happened, which was really great. And so um, I stayed here in Los Angeles because I just love Los Angeles. Um, and, um, and the art scene then in the early 90s or mid 90s was very favorable in a way for, um, you know, it was just, it, it was a good opportunity because for some reason everybody decided painting was okay again for a moment and, um, and that's what I was doing. And, um, and it, that, that was nice. And as Phyllis mentioned, by that time there were, you know, uh, art schools galore, lots of artists. There was already a kind of really great ecosystem of, um, you know, people who had come out through the art school um, kind of supporting each other, and that was something that was emphasized to me by mentors at CalArts when I was like, what happens next? They pretty much said, just look around you. Your peers are who are going to help you. It's, you know, it's your, who you're in school with. So um, it's probably similar now. And um, that's it. That's what I have. Oh, and, you know, I was actually, well, no, go ahead. Edit <laughs> yourself. I'm yes, curious. No, yes, no. <laughs> Is there any way to go back to Miami? Which one? The first one. The first one. Kind of... uh -huh. So, yeah, I graduated in 1988 with my MFA, and 
80s was all about neo-expressionism. And so logically, when you're in school, you're influenced by what's going on uh, in the art world. And uh, so this was kind of the influence of, I guess, abstract expressionism on me. And that season ended very quickly. Um, I had a gallery in 1990 when, oh, it was only two years after I graduated that I had my first solo show. Uh, but, you know, the work back then definitely had more of a Eurocentric uh, quality to it. Certainly my cultural background is mixed in it with these reversed uh, poems by Hafez, who's a very important poet for the Iranians. Um, and uh, the scene in LA it was thriving in the uh, late 80s, but it all came to sort of a collapse uh, as the market collapsed. And I think uh, we all had to, in a way, rethink uh, the, the, um, not the concept behind the work, but uh, the appearance of the work. So I actually started a body of work that we don't see here, and it was basically using non-traditional media. Uh, I used fabric and armatures, and for 13 years, my work was uh, very conceptual, but combining sculpture and painting together. Uh, scene changed again when Monique, uh, in the mid-90s graduated, there was again interest in painting and uh, uh, resurgence of that, and uh, certainly it thrived. And it continues to come back. Um, I started post uh, because there was a deficit. Uh, a lot of spaces had closed, even alternative spaces had closed. Uh, and I can think of quite a few of them. Um, Bliss. Mm -hmm. Uh, domestic setting, domestic setting um, food house, uh, uh, what else? Can you think of other ones? Lace had just moved from downtown to uh, Hollywood. So there were a lot of reasons motivating me to start this place in downtown, which was in my studio building. And I've always told the students, don't wait for someone else to come along and uh, discover you. Put your work out there yourself. Uh, and uh, earlier today, I actually went to visit my friends who have started a gallery in downtown San Bernardino, a little gallery down there. Um, and, uh, you know, they're interested in starting uh, this, you know, art scene uh, in San Bernardino. Uh, and I think ultimately it can help. Uh, those uh, that uh, start such projects, because there are collaborations that take place. And another friend, Brad Spence, is starting another space just around the corner from theirs. You know, so just do it all, you know. Uh, don't wait for it to happen by someone else's actions. Um, and the scene now in LA is, of course, insanely thriving. Um, there's not enough, but there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I really agree with Habib. Um, speaking as someone who didn't go to school in Southern California, um, I've been at a disadvantage in terms of networking. I've had to just work, not network, not only network, but work. Because if you don't have the work, you're not going to get anywhere. You've got to have something to show. So that's really what it comes down to, the bottom line. And artists have to stick together. Artists have to support each other. Artists have to show up for each other. What Habib was talking about, about um, creating uh, even pop-up venues or things online, different galleries to just get energy going, uh, it's just so important. You, you can do it, but it's not easy. You have to work hard, and you have to somehow make a living. So it comes down back to the affordability question of, you know, yes, in the beginning when I moved to LA, studio space was plentiful, it was cheap, not anymore, as we all know. 
Um, and so that's going to affect where you live. Like maybe you want to go to LA or New York and see what that's like, but you just can't afford to live there. And P.S. No one can hardly. So live and work where you can, but it's really, really important to get out and go to other cities, see what people are doing, see as much art as you can possibly stuff into your head, and then come home and make your work. That's it. Well, I'll go back to um, um, the history of the LA art scene as I knew it. I um, grew up in the 60s, and the scene and the city was very, very small. Um, <laughs> and um, in, in the neighborhood in which I grew up, there, the, uh, one of my friend's dad was the illustrator for Rocky and Bullwinkle. And there were other ceramicists. And, uh, another friend's father was the head of the art department of uh, Cal State Long Beach. So that was always in my um, experiences. But it was very small and it wasn't a big deal. Um, and um, going to art school, um, all the kids from the various art schools knew each other. And um, surprisingly or not, many of them later became very famous. They're now internationally known. And the scene has just, um, uh, there was a time when, you know, L.A. and people would just go, what's L.A.? Yeah. You know? uh, and when I first went to school uh, up north, even in San Francisco, they would say things like, L.A., that's a wasteland. And I just chuckled because I always loved L.A. And I would say, you don't need to come here. <laughs> no, I was perfectly happy with it. But anyway, it's expanded and changed and, um, uh, you know, it's beyond my really comprehension of what this place has become. It's amazing. Well, thank you all. Uh, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, some of you. Uh, but we'd like to talk a little bit about the, the looming presence of New York. Joe Good has said that uh, you were always encouraged to go to New York to make your work and that him and some others felt insulted by the idea and told to go elsewhere to do your work. And I, and I think in some sense this has a very interesting parallel with Sam and Dino, because most artists here, myself included, have been told to go elsewhere, LA and uh, New York still. Um, and so we're, we're kind of curious to know about that, the presence of New York in your careers and whether or not um, you felt as if it was a place you needed to go, uh, obviously not, but um, but kind of the influence of New York on California, and, uh, and then also some advice that you could offer the artists present in this room for, for how to deal with that kind of looming presence and, and make your own careers here. I don't, I don't think that New York, Los Angeles thing applies anymore at all. And I think, you know, if I can pinpoint a time when it, that, that comparison disintegrated was probably when CalArts became so prominent in the 80s. And a lot of artists uh, came from the East Coast to go to CalArts and stayed here specifically because they realized that there were so many more opportunities here. And I'm thinking of particularly like Mike Kelly, who came to CalArts from the East Coast. And, uh, and then there was a moment er, in the early 90s when a lot of the artists that were showing in New York were LA artists. So I, I think there, there's certainly more galleries in New York, probably New York still the, the money center of North America. And so there's a, a more burgeoning um, or a more well-developed art scene there as well. Uh, many more galleries, many more opportunities. But I, I certainly don't think it's necessary to go to New York anymore. Um, I was told that you had to have a show in New York to get really, to make, have a significant career in Los Angeles. I had a show in New York in 89. and. Nah, I just didn't really feel like it was that, you know, compelling. And I realized that one had to move there for a period of time in order to uh, operate in that art environment. And I wasn't willing and couldn't afford to do that in the 80s, so I just stayed in uh, California. Yes, um, 
I, I have the show in New York, uh, I think six or seven times, but I've never been in New York. Uh, I haven't gone to New York yet. Uh, and, I, <laughs> and I think, you know, like, it, it, it was a different, I don't see the different, because right now in the big city, it, it's all the artists from around the world that come to the city to work. So every place, like San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, or New York, they all the same kind of people. Uh, and what you see in the, in the, in the city itself that have been up differently, you know, between them. Uh, but uh, I'll take an example. If we see the American, uh, American Japanese artist in LA and American uh, uh, Japanese, American Japanese artist in New York, they're two different areas. But if you see both of their work, you can see something in common. Uh, that's what I think. And oh. I think New York still has, you know, such a fabulous museum scene that it's just always energizing to go there. And the museum shows that are in New York rarely get to L.A. So I think I, I love to go there and feel the energy. And That's see true. See all the work That's true. there. They're all the good museum over there. So, yeah. you know, we need to go there. But as, you know, Phyllis say, you know, I've been showing New York, but uh, after that, nobody know. You, you got to be in the area, uh, to be in the area and keep showing your work, you know, by the time you, people can remember you. But once in a while you're there and two weeks later people forget. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, you don't have to go in New York, like Phyllis say. Uh, and also in the San Bernardino, it's a uh, living cost, it much, uh, and, and the cost of study in the school is much cheaper than everywhere. Uh, but you can make a connection networking with LA, because LA is not that far. Uh, you can set once a month to go to see the show in LA and pick the day when they have so many shows so you can spend one day and see a lot of them. And I think that can give you, you know, connection with what, you know, in the LA, you know, and you don't have to go that far. Yeah. I, I want to, um, uh, in regards to this, I want to also address what Blue had said earlier and um, in that you want to just be making work and um, probably, you know, when you're young and you're just getting out of school and you probably put yourself in some kind of debt and, you know, it, it's just, and maybe you've got to got, keep a job going on. And so um, whatever you can afford is where you want to be. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then out of that, you'll hopefully get opportunities. And, but if you kind of, you know, for some reason, to, you know, stretch yourself, it's just going to be too stressful. And being an artist, believe it or not, is stressful as it is. And you all know this because you're probably studying art. So um, you don't need to add that on top. Um, there's, a, there's a metro line train that connects you guys to downtown Los Angeles. It's so amazing. I've just been riding the train a lot in the last couple of years and, and the bus lines too. Um, so um, even though it might feel like when you're here that you know uh, downtown Los Angeles is remote and New York is even farther, if you really, I, I really highly encourage you to do what you can, do what you can manage uh, while you're just getting out of school or while you're still in school, and then you know take it incrementally. What, what next step you can take, um, and. You know, New York, like everyone, everyone agrees. New York is—I mean, it's just institutionally the 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 the, the old country as far as uh, art is concerned. And so, yeah, visit it when you can afford to, and go see what you can. But I think um, the more of us who stay here and and make our awesome art here, um, the more we become a, a real contender and have become a real contender as a city for New York. And um, so, you know, stay here, but visit over there. But you know, if an opportunity takes you there, go there. But um, I wouldn't put the pressure on yourselves to feel like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta make it big in New York, because it, it's also just totally different than it used to be. And and uh, like I said, keep it. Keep it manageable, and, and things can grow from there. I would say. Yeah, New York is moving to LA. <laughs> right, it's true. Everywhere else as well. So there's the art scene. Um, but I think um, I see it 
the question more in relation to San Bernardino and LA, and I think others covered it, that uh, it's your, you're a short train ride away, uh, build it here and all of that stuff. And of course, share your materials with galleries in LA as well as anywhere else. And it's okay if someone takes interest and that moves you closer to LA or in LA. Um, I don't know, uh, Mike Kelly's name came up and I thought I should share that in his last interview, he said that if he knew the art world was this cutthroat, he would have chosen a different career uh, for himself. And as you mostly may know, he took his life uh, when he was 59, and um, which puzzled all of us who wanted to be uh, an art star like Mike Kelly. <laughs> so um, yes, uh, embrace life uh, in small ways and then uh, embrace uh, possibilities that go beyond uh, logic and uh, practice. Yeah. I pretty much already said mine, but I will uh, agree with everyone that um, I don't think it's important to live in New York. Los Angeles has grown up in, uh, in the eyes of the world, and we're a, an important contemporary art center. New York, New York is like the old school, old country for all the institutions that they have, and, and it's super important to go there. Um, I went to the Venice Biennale this summer for the first time, something I'd always wanted to go to. And uh, that's just another example of seeing art from all over the world and how important it is to get out and see, to go see those venues and um, expose yourself to the Ivory Coast Pavilion, the Iceland Pavilion. What are artists in Hungary doing? I mean, it's just you've got to get out when you can. Um, but I agree completely with uh, Monique that you've got to be able to afford to live first and then as your opportunities come to you, um, take them. Um, I want to just add that um, don't um, just be aware that, as Habib was saying, um, there are many art worlds. There's not just the big art world. I mean, you know, it's very tempting to just say, you know, I want to be in the art world, and and right. you imagine it as this kind of entity that you know, and that's it's got, you know, it's got a mountain shape, and there's only one pinnacle. But um, there are many art worlds, and um, and there's something for everyone. And so, one of the important things I think as students is to Really be honest with yourself about what kind of artist you are, what it is, what kind of artist you want to be, what is it you want to get out of being an artist? Is it, do you want to be, you know, ha show at Gagosian and make a gazillion dollars and maybe feel like you want to kill yourself? Or do you, or do you want to just make stuff and, you know, and that makes you feel good or whatever? But it's, but it's part of the, of figuring out what to do next is figuring out what kind of artist you are and then, and gravitate towards that portion of the art world that supports you and that's ready for you there, I would yeah. say. I don't know, maybe we were somewhat misinformed too. Um, I remember when I was in graduate school, mm -hmm. one of my professors, I won't name them, uh, <laughs> got very upset with me when I argued against the idea that we should all be out there trying to be professional artists. When I told him, you know, perhaps we have other ideas, he said, well, then you're wasting my time. Because, you know, that is sort of an art school uh, strategy to get you prepared to be a professional artist, that it's possible for you to make a living being a professional artist. Uh, so maybe we can blame schools uh, as much as uh, any other uh, component. Uh, to suggest that we can't intuitively uh, find our own path. You know, because ultimately, you have to listen to yourselves. Um, yeah, uh, others have their own ideas, but you deep down probably know what you need to do. Well, I just have to go back to New York for a second. Um, <laughs> New York is the big elephant in the room. It just cannot be avoided. Um, after I got out of art school, a lot of kids uh, went to New York to live and work. So I would go there often, and um, it was it's an exciting place. It's a, I find from LA, it's a very difficult place. 
and it was a place I only played around with perhaps living and trying to create a life there, but it was more of a fantasy for me. I hated the weather. It was very, um, I mean, it's the streets just, the electricity on the streets, you could feel it, it's, you, you can't avoid it. But, um, and also, if you're a really good artist, New York will pick you up. It's just, you don't have to live there, uh, you know, to develop, develop a New York, which is really an international um, reputation. And that's my opinion. Of New York. Wonderful. I, I, I couldn't agree with you all more that if you're artists, you have a compulsion to make, essentially, and we, we shouldn't be bounding ourselves by location. Uh, on that note, I would like to know a little bit about how location has influenced your, your work and the title of the show, Being Made in California, how has California in particular influenced the work you, you make? Um, well, I was, uh, as I said, I was in Vancouver and I wanted to stay on the West Coast because I grew up in a really cold place in the middle. And uh, I was attracted to LA because of the feminist art scene here, women's building. Actually, it was the um, wave of feminist art in the early 19, late 1960s and early 1970s that compelled me to have a career in the arts. And so um, Los Angeles was really exciting for me on that basis. Also, I was interested in ceramics, sculpture and ceramics, and there was a, I guess, more of a, a interesting ceramic scene probably in San Francisco, but um, it, it's, I knew, had some friends of friends who were students here in the Los Angeles area, so I thought that would be a good place to go. Um, and it's still compelling. There were a lot of, uh, the, the, actually my interest in the feminist art scene, although I am still a feminist and very important part of my work is making work that relates to the uh, craft and uh, decorative issues. But I, um, I didn't really feel a connection to the women's building people that I thought I would, but I became very, fascinated with all the schools and all the various kinds of art venues that I encountered. So, I, again, I thought it was so much more interesting and um, a place that had so much more opportunity than where I had come from. So, I stayed there. I had found, found jobs and I was always, and up until like two or three years ago, I was always juggling two or three jobs. It got to be better jobs that I was juggling, but, um, I was always, people say, well, how should you work out your life? Should you teach? Should you work for other artists? Should you find a job that has nothing to do with art? And I could give you diff different answers. I would have given you different answers at different times over the last you know, 30 years that I've been here. But um, there was always uh, the opportunity to make things. And really, when I finished school, it was like, a goal was just to be able to have a studio and make things. Things have changed a little and people are more interested in like strategy and making a lot of money and those possibilities didn't exist. I was just happy to have a job, couple of jobs and a studio to make art work in. So Los Angeles was good for that. It was cheap to live here uh, when I first moved here and downtown studios were cheap in the early 80s. That's not the case anymore. But artists, not all artists have, want, or need the kind of studio that I did as a sculptor, so. Yes, uh, uh, I'm a painter, I paint landscape. So California kind of unlimited inspiration for me. Uh, in two hours, you can go from the ocean to the mountain to the desert. So mostly uh, my work, okay, up there. Uh, <laughs> It, it is a combined landscape. I pick, I pick up everywhere, everything, you know. Some part of them uh, lost uh, in uh, California, but some of them in different play around the world. So I travel and I combine them. And for me, nature, uh, California provides enough nature for me for inspiration. 
and uh, and and I think you know one of the subject matter you can pen, you can create the same subject matter and and you don't have to worry about uh, this subject matter is old or, or, or new no more. You know, but, uh, look at the policies there. Uh, he paints 60 times the Mao uh, uh, Sen uh, Mao uh, Victor Sen Victor. So he paints 60 times with the same mountain. So you know, for me, it's a real inspiration. You know, to be in California. Yeah. I um, already mentioned that I tried New York, and <laughs> in between undergrad and graduate school, and um, and. It, it wasn't that I, I, I didn't like it. It was, a, it was a, a very interesting, especially in the late 80s, was a really kind of very dynamic place to be. But um, um, I, I'm here in Los Angeles partially because it, it just, for me, as, as a, uh, I, have, I feel very tied to this you know, state because of my, my history and my family all comes from Mexico. And it, and it, it feels very familiar and comfortable for me. And I don't think that um, a person need necessarily stay where you feel comfortable. Sometimes it's better to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. But um, um, I think as a as an as an artist, it felt um, as a it felt as though there were less people looking over my shoulder when I was making work than it did in New York. Um, it was you know in New York. Every, it's a small, much smaller space. It's small. Manhattan is much smaller than Los Angeles. So, like, you literally bump into artists just going to get, you know, a cup of coffee or something. And some people thrive on that kind of connection, but some people do not. And I, I need space and a little bit of time and stuff. Be, and I, you know, feel like I, I'm going to meet people when I'm ready to meet them. And so, Los Angeles for me has always felt like a place where that is much more possible. Um, on the other hand, as a painter, I will say that um, it, it's not the most painter-friendly city compared to New York. And that's something I've learned the hard way over the years. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not doing painting, no big deal. But if you're a painter and you really think about painting a lot and you make a lot of painting, it's kind of hard sometimes to not have that same that it, to not have that audience that they have there built in of people who kind of just grew up looking at painting, they kind of get what your references are. It, it's not happening so much here, and it, it's it's a little it's a little you kind of out on a limb here, but you find your way. So. <laughs> um, well, I think Los Angeles is like an addiction. Um, and maybe the weather, I don't know. The weather is always better here. Um, I've never left LA since my family moved here. Um, I think my work certainly uh, has both influences, my Iranian uh, Islamic influences, as well as growing up most of my life in uh, Southern California. So. Uh, you can see the influence of the Iranian uh, culture in the early works with the reverse poetry, uh, reverse poetics. And the reason for the reversal was that I would come across it in books. Uh, and you can't really tell it's in reverse unless you can read it. And I thought this was an interesting way of suggesting that East remains veiled to the West. Even when I changed the look of my work, um, which happened kind of intuitively, uh, I moved more in the direction of uh, the site that influenced me. So uh, not only the fabric that I used uh, with armatures uh, was seen as a reference to the culture of the veil, the Islamic culture, uh, but because these were sheer uh, fabric, fabric stretched over armatures. Um, their presence was very much uh, in tune with the light and space movement of Southern California. Uh, and you know, to this day, when I look at my work, uh, I see these ideas that have uh, preoccupied uh, my thinking and uh, uh, has been at the heart of my work, this East and West. Uh, and uh, of course, a space is going to influence you, your practice will influence you, 
So when I opened a second gallery on Wilshire Boulevard, which was uptown and not close to the laboratory in downtown where my studio was, uh, I got to learn about the part of art world that I wasn't as aware of. You know, the uh, politics of support became very important and actually contributed to a body of work that I did. There were life-size portraits of art world people. Um, so yeah, I think the place definitely influences the practice. When I moved to Los Angeles from Santa Fe, I was faced with the, that decision of feeling restless, like I wanted to move to a bigger city. So which one was it going to be, New York or Los Angeles? Those were the choices at that time. <clears throat> and I just thought, as a wilderness person, I will die in New York. This is not going to happen. So at least in LA, there was space, there was the ocean, there were mountains. So I chose to move there. And um, I started getting involved in doing a lot of public art commissions when I came and did a lot of research into the history and environmental issues of Southern California. And that became a big influence on my work, particularly on the subject of water, which has been my main subject um, since like the early 90s in one way or another. And initially, it started with the lawn. When I came to Los Angeles, I was just so struck by this completely inappropriate European landscape convention that had been grafted onto the desert. And I wanted to work with that because the tension between having water and not having water, class issues, who could afford to have the green lawn, who couldn't afford it, who wanted it, who didn't want it. So that, um, there, <clears throat> this image is um, the first time I really ventured into installation and sculpture from my painting practice. And this is called Mirandi's Lawn. It's a piece that I, uh, is, was an homage to Giorgio Mirandi, the Italian painter who painted still lifes of simple household objects from his home. And for a year, I collected all the recycling from our, the household of my husband and I. And I would photograph it in the background. You, you can't see the photographs, but in the, in the, uh, I would set up the still life of that day's recycling and photograph it, just like Mirandi did his compositions, or at least aspiring to be that. And then each object was covered with artificial turf, uh, which is very popular here now. And I had to do it for a whole year so I'd get enough objects to be actually lawn scale. And ever since, so this was really my first um, big venture into sculpture and installation um, that I've kept up with and uh, explored thoroughly everything there is to do with the lawn <laughs> and uh, in all kinds of different media, painting, drawing, sculpture, and installation. And I'm still, although I've moved away from that particular trope, I'm still very interested in water and uh, especially now more about the ocean. My focus has come to, the, uh, to be more about the ocean. And the work that I have here in this exhibition uh, is partially inspired by the research that I've done in marine biology and how interesting. Um, you would not believe that the sex life of fish is actually really interesting. I know nobody believes that, but it's really true. When you talk about gender fluidity, man, that's it right there. The males turn into females, the females turn into males. Oh, it's time for me to be a male. OK. So it's really fascinating. And uh, what I've, I'm a big scuba diver. I go all over the world and, uh, and dive. And what I've seen underwater has really uh, influenced my work, and especially this work that I'm showing here now. And one thing, uh, so, so that's very California. The whole question of water and our relationship to water in this, in this landscape has been a huge influence. And now going forward, um, sea level rise and ocean plastic is something that I'm really interested in, in dressing in my work and in my life. And obviously, the California coast is central to the identity of California and our sense of place as Californians. It's going to control and define who we are and where we are and what we, what we are in the future, it's something that everyone in this room is going to have to deal with. Uh, we're already dealing with it. And so California as a place just continues to unfold its richness and be fascinating to me. 
all the time. Um, well, Southern California to me is uh, my whole frame of reference. And um, so my family is originally from Japan and uh, at the turn of the century there was relatively a fairly large immigration to the whole West Coast. So there are a lot of um, cultural references uh, vis-a-vis Japanese that I'm very familiar with. Also, all of the people I work with and who inspire me are all here. And um, I, I actually think of myself as a provincial and really, um, you know, that's who I am. I love this place. Coming from LA to San Bernardino, just crossing the 210, you've got the mountains here. You've got this whole sloping, used to be empty land, very arid, and just so dramatically picturesque. Yeah. And it's not just LA, it's Southern California, the mm -hmm. people who live here, the landscape, it's terrific. Yeah. Wonderful, we're, we're a little bit over on time for the second part, but I think this okay. last component is, is really important for artists um, going through school now, but we'd like to, to know about the networking component of being an artist and the role of critics and galleries and in that same vein how technology and the internet has changed that for you as artists today. Um. Well, I think networking is super important and uh, it's really, I think, uh, one of the disadvantages of not going to school in Southern California is that you don't, you, you don't have a group that you identify with because it was apparent to me when I first came here that students identified with the school they went to. Um, and it provides uh, uh, a frame of reference. It also provides um, a group of friends that you can go and discover artwork together. I, I rather see at this point um, that I, I could talk about how when I, you know, in the 80s when I was first embarked on my career in the artist, as, as an artist that um, the gallery critic thing was very important and one's goal was usually to find an ex solo exhibition at a gallery. I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. There's, as Habib said, and Habib is a great example of someone who ran a, a very compelling and uh, interesting program, uh, an alternative space for a long time. Um, and then there's, of course, as uh, Diego mentioned, the whole aspect of self-promotion that the internet provides that wasn't the case when um, I graduated from school. I mean, you know, I was talking, Lou and I drove here together and we were talking about the old difficulty of having slides of your work and how many duplicates you needed and how to pass them around and how to you know, get your work into shows, and now it's just so easy to find out where those opportunities are. Not that they will necessarily come your way, um, but it's really, I think, there's just a much more diverse and healthy environment uh, for artists. And then Monique, Monique's point was good, which is that there are, you know, there's not just one art world, there's a lot of different um, aspects of artists' artwork that you can plug your work into, plug yourself into, and and uh, thrive from. So I think that critics, you know, everybody wants to have reviews and get, you know, a, a stuff that they can send around and stuff that they can post. And uh, there are apparently artists who can sell a lot of stuff on the internet by themselves. I'm not one of them, and I've never t really tried to do it, but I guess I'm still part of the more traditional model. I have a gallery that represents me, et cetera, but um, I think there's just uh, a lot of opportunities that one, um, to which one can avail oneself without uh, going that traditional gallery, gallery path, which, as Hung said, is very competitive. And, you know, on the one hand, there's, a, there's sites like uh, Jody Zellin and Brian Moss call, have one called What's On Los Angeles, and they have, you know, dozens of gallery listings, and it's impossible to go to every opening in town on any, on any night. You know, it used to be more possible. 
it's impossible now for a couple of reasons. One is that there's so many places, and the other is that it's so damn hard to drive around in LA <laughs> that uh, it's impossible for that reason. So, you know, but there's other, the other ways to connect with people now that I think is great. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, the artist is usually very lonely because when you work, you have to be alone. Uh, and I think that the character of the artist to be alone. But uh, to make something happen it, nowadays, you need a lot of connection, uh, networking. Uh, one of the things is you, you got to find how to show your work. And when you show your work, it's interesting enough that uh, the art critic uh, can you know write the article about that, or, and probably uh, hopefully the, some dealer gonna contact you. Uh, but I think you know the part of uh, of working by yourself to create a good work, but also have to find some time uh, to be uh, in out there uh, to know people, uh, friendly, uh, be respect and uh, humble, and I think that the good. Uh, that a good part to, to, to start, you know, really humble and friendly. Uh, talking about the technology and, uh, and something about computer technology right now, I don't use that much for my creating my art. Everything I do is just manual. I do, I, I, I wish, you know, because sometimes I create an art and the painting doesn't mask the area. Uh, if I know, if I can use a computer, I may do the test so I can see that, but uh, I don't think I want to do that. Uh, I'm still working, you know, with my manual and I don't use much of the digital technology uh, for my artwork. But, but the internet and technology is still very um, important now as a day for you to self-promote and uh, networking even, you don't need you don't need to see the uh, the people in the person, but at least you know you know them through the social media. Uh, that the part of the thing is free. Uh, use it, uh, smart. Uh, yeah, you know that's what I mean. Yeah, I, I would agree. You you guys are you have an advantage. I feel like because of social networking and because of the, your ability to have a website and represent yourself fully with whatever it is you feel like showing people. And I would highly uh, recommend getting whatever friend you have that's clever enough to make your website to do it for you and put all your stuff up. Um, and again, I would just go back to just, you know, um, the ties that you make with your peers in school. Um, keep those strong, you know, people you have, you know, feeling, fellow feeling, you like their work, they like your work. Um, that's the energy that's going to carry you forward and inspire you to, you know, make your own space somewhere. and. And, um, and, and once you have that kind of going, then maybe someone from a gallery comes by and sees what you're up to and invites you know, a more established whatever where there's more money. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I feel somewhat not qualified to speak more on this because I'm actually in a phase of life where I've, I've broken up all my ties with galleries. I've, I've, I'm pulling back. I'm spending more time just alone in the studio just making my work and um, uh, it's, it, I, I kind of there was there's like a yeah I'm on the I'm on this slope of like I think I just want to keep it like very personal now um, but I but you're young and energetic and I would definitely say take advantage certainly of all the technological advantages that are offered to you now at this in this particular moment for sure. <laughs> yeah, things have really changed uh, for sure. Um, <laughs> Several times. You know, all, yeah. all the stuff that you've heard is true. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to CalArts, you have a different kind of support system than if you go to Claremont. I went to Claremont and uh, one of the reasons I started Post was because I felt that Claremont was not a strong enough support system for its graduates. So in a weird way, I tried to um, fill in where they lacked. I think they're trying a little bit harder now, but uh, I definitely felt that deficit. Uh, I don't really know who's left of my graduate class. Uh, you know, I have one friend that I still stay in contact with, but you know, your peers are really your best support system. So 
developing that is important. You know, perhaps they'll be with you for the rest of your career. Um, again, you know, make the work. It's the most important thing. And uh, so that's a dialogue between you and your work primarily. Uh, and so uh, uh, the other stuff is out there. There are advantages to going to these fancy schools where you have to go into debt for a couple hundred thousand dollars nowadays. <laughs> or maybe you better buy a house. You know? I mean, I don't really know. Uh, when I went to school, it wasn't so expensive. And uh, uh, I think I ended up with maybe $15,000 of debts, which my uh, second grant that I got paid off. But it took 15 years. Um, so it's an immoral situation, I think, to make students pay, art students in particular, pay uh, $200,000 for a graduate uh, degree. Uh, so you have to decide for yourself what your priorities are. But again, the most important thing is you and your work and that dialogue. And if others get implicated in that dialogue, it's fantastic. But keep looking to your work and to your um, relationship with your work. Uh, and all the other stuff is true, but you know, embrace what you can and what your realities, individual realities, allow. I agree with everything everyone said and I would also um, like to encourage you all to do a lot of studio visits I mean not just reach out to your peers and um, and anybody who will talk to you basically you've got to be friendly you got to be access uh, um, you got to bring your aloha you got to meet people you've got to reach out to them and I, I, I think studio visits are fantastic you with your friends or curators or whoever it is that you meet, practice talking about your work. It's super important. You're going to need to know how to write about your work. You're going to need to know how to talk about your work. You're going to need to know how to think about your work. You can't do that without practicing. Apply for some grants, even if you don't think you have a chance. Just the exercise of sitting down, forcing yourself to look at the sheet, answer the questions, Write your responses. You know what it's like. You're in school. Okay, well, it keeps going, okay? This is when you get out of school, you're only at the beginning of all the writing that you're going to have to do. And <laughs> I hate to tell you. Um, but I would definitely advocate for um, applying for things because it, even if you don't get them, which is frustrating and depressing, um, sometimes you do get them, which is great. But what happens is that you learn to think about your own work and you learn to talk about your own work. Just put yourself in the, you know, five years from now and you're somewhere, you're, you've been introduced to a curator or a museum person and they say, or a collector, and they say, oh, so what are you working on now? Tell me about your work. What are you going to say? You better sound smart. You have to have something to say. You can't just say, well, you know, rah, rah, rah. uh uh. There's too many people out there that are good at it. You've got to help yourself and teach yourself how to do that. I think it's super important. And as far as social media goes, use it. Have a website, like Monique said, um, if you can possibly pull that together. Use uh, your social media feed. Instagram, I would say, is a, you know, one of the main platforms for artists sharing images and their um, and their show announcements. Use that stuff. Um, I don't use uh, the internet in my actual artwork because I'm, I'm an object maker. I, I make things with the hand. But I do use it for research. I use social me uh, uh, Instagram for my promotion and um, for sourcing materials. I get materials from all over the world. Um, when I first I, I shared my work uh, in Santa Fe and Denver before I moved to Los Angeles. I've, I have had galleries, a gallery representation for most of my adult life. When I came to Los Angeles and didn't know anyone, um, I had to start from ground zero. 
And the way I got my first gallery was by just going there all the time. And I, I developed a relationship with the woman who owned the gallery over time by talking to her. I mean, just go up to people and start talking to them. You know, and if, if they act like a snob and they freeze you out, then just say, okay, next, you know, go to <laughs> some other place. Find a place where you feel comfortable, try to establish a relationship, keep showing up, and eventually somebody's gonna say, oh, you know, hey, I'd like to see what you're doing. That, could, that happens, so try it. <laughs> How many of you are, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. It, Wayne. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, networking is how I know all of these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, since people is one of my uh, portfolio, um, in order to grow that portfolio, I need to network, but also I can have a tendency to isolate myself. And the internet is good for being connected, uh, you know, without uh, an actual face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah. And um, everyone is different, and you'll use these they're all tools and they're all available to you and you'll find a way, or perhaps not, of taking advantage of them. But also just in terms of the internet, uh, you know, people are using it as uh, a media tool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could use that um, as your studio as well, as for networking and various other things. So you really do need to find your place and where you're comfortable with all of those things that Diego brought up. How many of you are uh, graduate students and how many are undergraduate students? Do you have a grad program here? Any graduate students? No? All undergraduate. Well then, uh, you know, think about maybe graduate school or not and then, uh, you know, decide what you can afford and what you can't afford again. But it does, I don't know, have its benefits to go to certain institutions over other institutions. But again, you know, we do what we can and it's possible, especially nowadays, because there's so many great artists that make their living as teachers, that you can get the same education at uh, any uh, university level. Um, you don't have to go to these fancy schools uh, for the education part, but you know they're they are what we've heard they are as they are like powerful mafias and all of that. I don't know. Do you agree with any of that? You went to uh, CalArts, right? I'll, I'll I'll make a confession. I went to CalArts. <laughs> um, very ignorantly and naively, I, I, I went to Catholic school my whole life, and, um, and the nuns made us write a, an essay when we were graduating from eighth grade, and uh, what do you see for yourself for the future? And I, and, you know, coming from a Latina family with very little means, there was, I said, well, I want to be an art, I would like to be an artist, but my family doesn't approve. If I were to be able to go study at CalArts, which, at the time used to be uh, in, in Los Angeles when I was a kid growing up. You could drive by what was Chenard that became CalArts. And I was just naively like, that was the only art school I'd ever been conscious of and the only art school I'd ever seen. So I just got stuck in my head, that's where you go to art school. So <laughs> when I, you know, when it came time to be, to pick a graduate or to go to graduate school, I only applied to one school <laughs> because that's what I, foresaw for myself in eighth grade. It wasn't because I was like, wow, CalArts is the place to go. And, 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 and so, you know, it was on some level, obviously a, a big mistake as far as a painter, but not. So you just, you don't know. You, you know, I, I did it not because I was being so ambitious. I, I, I was doing it because I was being a little stupid. But <laughs> um, even stupid can work sometimes. But um, it, it, it definitely, um, I don't know what it's like now. It is very expensive, and I, I'm, I have three kids, grown kids myself. One of them's done with college. Two of them are still in it. So I'm, I'm in the trenches with you. We're, you know, I, I, we made sure they all got scholarships. Um, you know, they they worked like crazy in order. So, it, it it's no small consideration. Um, 
where you go and, and how you can afford to pay for it and whether your parents are behind you or not, whether you're going to work. I put myself through school. No one paid for me to go to school. I worked. I, I, when I graduated from CalArts, I was nine years older than all my peers because I was working my way through school the whole time. So, um, and that works. That's fine. You grow up. You have a life while you're being an artist and, and you have more to bring to it. But it's, it, you really got to ask yourself what, what it is you want out of being an artist and, and what are you willing to do to achieve that. And, you know, maybe your goals are smaller, maybe they're bigger, but just knowing what they are, it's easier to figure out what, which way to go. Do you think it helped that your uh, contemporaries were, well, the, your colleagues at school were the people that they were, I mean, you can name them. I can name them if you want, but you know them better than I. Um, it, it's it's hard to know what what went right and what went wrong. So obviously something went right, and and some of my peers things went really right. And um, but it, again, it comes back to your temperament. Like, what kind of temperament do you have? Uh, you know, um, someone um, you know someone who gets into a school like CalArts and then goes into a very competitive gallery scene and that like they love it. It's like they love the, the, the edge of it, they thrive on it and they run with the ball to the end goal. And other people, it's kind of a real it's hard. It's like you know, it's like uh, you're constantly making choices that don't that don't sit well with you. So I'm I'm more of that kind of person. So um, uh, definitely you know, I don't know, it, 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 you know. You know, like I saw that article that Lane wrote yeah. in Art Forum that yeah. grouped some of the CalArts painters together at the time. Right. You know, those kinds of things. I mean, I, it came from... I, I think... Um, so, sorry, sorry. Sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I've been a horrible timekeeper here. Uh oh. So I want to talk about this very last <laughs> yeah. component. And we're actually going to start with Wayne here. Uh, yeah. But I'd like to talk a little bit about portraits in the show and, and Wayne if you could share a little bit of your of approach to photographing these artists and maybe some of uh, the intention you might have in, uh, in those portraits and then if everyone can briefly as briefly as they can discuss a little bit of their experience being photographed by Wayne. <laughs> well uh, it's uh, many varied reasons but uh, an important one is documentation and uh, uh, object, this is a subject that uh, I've had uh, just uh, more than an interest in my entire life. So it's an opportunity to actually be bold and take these people's time. It's, it takes a lot out of their day to spend some time with me. And um, I try to learn as much about them beforehand as I can and their work. And. Um, the chemistry that goes on, I'm not quite sure how that comes about, but mm -hmm. hopefully that's developed. And um, researching them and knowing them uh, also as uh, friends, I feel a lot of you are friends. Um, I try to pull, well, I don't know what I try to do, but I think <laughs> there's some psychological component also that hopefully will come through. And, so that's where I like to go with them. Thank you. Can I just say uh, something I really enjoyed when Wayne came to the studio was that the whole time he was taking pictures, we were just talking, we were talking, talking about our backgrounds, and because we both grew up in Los Angeles, we had things to talk about, and I, I, I think that I felt like somehow that synergy was brought to what he, what kind of photographs he took, and it was very. I found it a very kind of enlivening experience, and I really liked the, the, the proofs that he shared with me. And uh, it's kind of, I feel like you hear about like when people sit for a portrait, I feel like there's like an energy that passes because he's, he's looking at you, but he's also kind of trying to help you relax. And it's, it was really very thrilling. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. I think um, the chemistry comes out of the fact that you le lend yourself to the work. You do your homework before you come, but when you you really lend yourself to the artist's work and you 
and that informs how you see the artist. And it comes through in the photographs. And you're not afraid to try unusual things. It's not a conventional situation. Were you surprised with my portrait of you? I was at the time. Whoa, I was like, whoa, dang, I'm fierce. I like it. <laughs> Really but great. that was so funny because... I thought I was taking a lot of liberties with that. So yeah, you, <laughs> I didn't know did, how you would respond you to did that. take some liberties. I like that, though. It was good. And the second time, too. But uh, the first time Wayne came to my studio, it was for a show that he invited me to be his partner. In, artists were going to do portraits of each other. So that was really interesting. But yeah, you're... you're it, like Monique says, when you come, you just have a conversation, and it, I hate getting my picture taken, but Wayne made it easy mm -hmm. and uh, showed me some stuff about myself that I wasn't sure that it was actually showing, but mm -hmm. apparently it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not very photogenic, but it made me look on your hair. I don't know what propelled them to get me to stand on the edge of the elevator for that shoot, but... Uh, Good place. Maybe he knew I did performances and <laughs> that had kind of a performative quality to it. Um, is mine? It's a black and white. Yeah, they were taken from two, two and a quarter negs, and that's where the um, digital thing really came about, because I couldn't compose that without running it through Photoshop. It's a great one. Yeah, for me, uh, when come and uh, and I think he he looked whatever in the, my studio and work from there. So uh, we don't know exactly what we're gonna do, but uh, I feel very comfortable with when uh, he look around and he suggest this and that, you know, and uh, uh, really work well. And uh, one of the good things after the photo uh, taking, and a few days later, a week, you know, he sent a couple of uh, one for me. You know, that's a great one. You know, I can look at that and I say, that's a good photograph. Yeah. Thank you, Wen. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, the portrait that Wayne took of me is with a giant self-portrait sculpture I did of myself like about five years ago, 2014, 15, and it was, I think, Wayne, you'd seen that. Did you come and see that before you brought your camera over? I well, think you did. Was, uh, um, everyone was talking about it, like Lois had said it used to. Oh, right. You know, big, big sculpture. Was, uh, at, in the window at the old, egg, I mean, at the... Um, Craft and, what was the craft and folk right. art? Right, right. So I was uh, prepared to okay. try to so, uh, integrate the two. So I had to, the, the figure is obviously taller than I, so I had to stand on a ladder. And so I got taller. I am taller than the figure. And <laughs> so I like that about it. It's the only, it's the, like no other image I have of myself. And I did, I did use the portrait. Um, I cropped it away from the, I, I mean, I just cropped out my um, head and I've used it for some sort of publicity purposes where I needed a photo of myself because I liked it. But it's fun to have the photo on the ladder. I like, like that a lot. Yeah, I use a uh, uh, wind photo a lot for my uh, suddenly show and they need, you know, portray the artist they use that. But I also remind the people when they print that, you know, just put the credit to when. Yeah, so, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you all. Uh, at, at this point in the conversation, we'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, this is time to ask them. <laughs> done a lot of things. I've been working as an artist for about 40 years. Um, I like to make things. I've never really been a painter. It's one thing I haven't done, and I don't think I am interested in being a painter. Um, I did have a fling with digital media for a while, and I was very interested in 
um, comparing um, actual reality with digital reality. So I made some pieces that combined both sculptural pieces and animations that had the sculpture. And I really felt like it wasn't me. And actually the pieces that I have in here, the auto things, which were really like hands-on and very material oriented, are what I was my refuge after I finished this long animation, which took me months and months and months and months. Um, and I really wanted to get my hands in something, and that's what I like. So, I don't know what there is out there that I haven't tried that I'd like to do, but I'm open to, open to different things. You know, I'm, people are talking about their career, and I think, uh, and Monique expressed it in her own way, but when you get out of school, you're like trying to think of how you can fit yourself into the art world. And after a few uh, decades of working like me, you're thinking, how can I get my, still make artwork and relate to other artists, but get out of the art world? <laughs> so that's where I am. I, I, I mentioned it before. I, I recently started making stuff, um, so, sewing with fabric and hand sewing. Um, I just, I've, I've always made um, clothes and stuff like that just because I like to, um, but I just recently tried making art with this <laughs> these skills and it was really fun so I'll probably do a little bit more of that I think I, I really like technology and what can be accomplished with it uh, I, I don't know I'm tempted to learn uh, writing code no, I, 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 I mean I, I, I I don't know, you can use it to construct websites, but I think you can do other things with it, too. I remember having this conversation with George Baker. He teaches at UCLA, and anyway, he was trying to write something about the difference of one's experience in relation to analog photography and digital photography, and, you know, I immediately thought, well, you know, the romance is gone, because the dark room was like the camera. You could go inside the camera. But, um, you know, with digital technology, how do, how do you have that kind of romantic relationship with it? Uh, you know, I'm thinking that you have to know it on that kind of level, being inside the instrument. And how can you be inside this digital camera? Maybe you need to learn code and, uh, you know, software, which is kind of an extension of code. But, you know, I'm very multimedia. Uh, I want to use a torch um, to cut some, I don't know, shapes out of uh, metal that relate, you know, to the images that you saw so far. I've explored them in cardboard. I'd like to cast them. I'd like to, um, you know, have that painterly edge to the sculpture. So using a torch might give me that. Yeah, I really like exploring. Um, always coming back to painting, so extended field of painting, mm. but all media. Mm. Oh, um, I'm going to, uh, can, well, I've recently started uh, exploring scale, like scaling my work up a lot, scaling up the materials, like from thread to rope, from rope to big rope, and uh, exploring that so that's what I'm going to be engaged in, is a whole other palette of materials that are on a uh, much bigger scale, seeing what that's, what that's like. Is there any other? Yeah. Uh, I really just touched on it a little bit. You mentioned uh, about getting out of the art world, but um, I guess with respect to each of your own careers, what is the next move for you guys? Like what, what's the next movie you're going to be doing? Well, I'm, I'm just sort of, I find myself, I'm, I, I was teaching for a long time. I started teaching in 89. I taught at LMU and then I taught at UCLA and I retired teaching at USC. Um, and um, I just have a lot of opportunities lately and I'm, I'm busy making art, showing art. Um, 
I, I am aware, as most of my peers are, of the um, um, separation and or the all the corruption and the money concerns of the art world, which I try to um, keep a distance from. Um, but I would just to keep like to keep doing what I'm doing, just having a studio, showing my work, not necessarily in gallery, museum environments. And I also feel compelled to um, help other artists, women artists particularly in my case, move forward. So I like to do um, projects that involve um, educating other women artists about the opportunities and the pitfalls of the world called art. Yeah, me, it's, uh, I think I keep doing what I'm doing now uh, uh, until I get more and I'm going to find something else. And, but the most important is I enjoy myself doing that and also uh, how to maintain another side It my health. Uh, people need to be healthy. Uh, that part of me I always concerned because I want to do, I want to create my art in a long, long time, you know. I don't want to be sick. So, yeah, that a part of me, you know, keep, you know, yeah, keep maintaining my health, you know, in a good shape. I agree with Hung. I actually had some health issues that helped me scale back my work over the last few years, and everything's much better now. But um, being healthy is really important. I'm, I've, I've always made art at this. It's been very important to me all along since since I, I got out of school to just be a family member at the same time as being an artist and not making one more important than the other. And so that's just where I'm continuing my, like I said, my kids are, you know, almost done with school and, um, you know, gee, I'd like to be a grandma. <laughs> um, but I can, you know, I, I go in my studio pretty much every day and see what I can do. Um, I haven't been painting so much, but some of that has to do with my issues that I had. I had a big surgery and, but, um, but sewing has been very good to me, and um, uh, yeah, keeping keeping good health and good temp and good good mood is, is important at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, health is really important, <laughs> especially when you well get to be my age. Everyone else is younger. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, health. <laughs> poor, poor young people. <laughs> like, oh. They, they, they haven't think about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> no more questions? No more? Yes, questions. Um, so, I, I kind of have my foot in your illustration and stuff like that. You know, doing things for other people a lot, and then also teaching art. And having those really private creative jobs kind of like makes me really tired to do my own work. So, I'm wondering how you personally <laughs> it's it's hard, you know. I still try to figure out what, what is it best to just like have a, a job that you show up to and do what you're supposed to do, or do you want to be a creative? You know, when I start doing uh, what you know pretty uninteresting jobs, I think, wow, I'd really rather be in the in an art environment. I like teaching because you are in an environment with other artists and it's a creative environment. Um, I've worked for artists and that, that has its positives and negatives. You know, I sometimes think I, I wish I didn't know what I knew so early. <laughs> it's more fun and more uh, exciting to be naive and wait for things to come, come up rather than in see them through um, the eyes of a, a more experienced person, but I, I like to do creative things, and I think you're uh, happier doing things where I have some creative outlet, you know, or in, in, in a creative environment than just, you know, like working at a Kinko's or something. Mm -hmm. I, can I just, I would offer the advice that um, something I feel like I learned along the way is that you, you, you should 
don't be so hard on yourself. Like, uh, I think that there's a tendency it's, it's in this country, especially like the idea of the artist is that you're, you know, it's kind of like a Protestant ideal of like, you're in the studio every day. You're, you know, if you're not doing that, you're not a real artist. And I think you, you, are, you are an artist, you're a creative person, and that's not gonna go away if you, if you need to take a break if you're not working for a couple of months on your creative work because you need to do your job work. Um, that you bring yourself to the moment every, ev everywhere. I mean, even if you're not physically in the studio or what, whatever your practice is, you're, you're, you're living your life and that uh, ideally is gonna be part of your work whether you mean for it to be or not. So um, I, would, I would just advise like, try not to be too anxious about like, ah, you know, am I really being a real creative person if I'm spending so much time doing this other work that kind of supports me? Uh, one thing about uh, like the art, uh, different than the art, the art like you play music, uh, like piano, violin, you need to practice, you know, daily, and if you stop, you know, something gets gone. But if you're an artist, you're a painter, or you're a sculpture, uh, I don't think you can, you cannot lose it. Yeah. You know, after the few years, you come back and, or, or the short moment, a long moment, you come back, sometimes you do better because you answered, uh, you angry because you couldn't do that much at time. So uh, I think the thing is we need to see the priority. You know, I, I was an illustrator also. Uh, the thing is work for me, I need to find the play that pay me better. So that's the whole idea, and, uh, and all the, all the, the other thing you can do is you know, just cut, you know, cut the, the hour working, you know, making living, so you have to live you know, very simple. Uh, that's the way you know, to, uh, to get by. You know, I had a, well, I still call him guru uh, in junior college, my painting teacher, and Oh, you know, I used to spend all day in there painting, and one night, 10 p.m. it was, he, he saw me in there and he goes, um, you know, art is like an addiction, and if you can't handle it, you got to get out now. So, you know, it's addiction, but it's also your medicine, you know, in that when you're practicing it, it makes you hopefully feel good, you know. Now, I've always relied on it as a form of therapy, you know. Um, it's kind of like when I was younger, I'd get sick, I'd go swimming in the ocean. And I really believe that, you know, that um, going every day and hitting the salt water would take away all my illnesses, you know. And so with art, I think, for me, it has worked on that kind of therapeutic level. I mean, you can trace it back to Aristotle that if it fails on all level, it you know succeeds in terms of being therapeutic. Uh, so make time for it so you can feel better. You know. Um, I think it's um, really important to keep the door open to your impulses and your uh, intuitive thoughts as an artist and even if you can't produce a finished product or a finished piece of artwork just bring a notebook just like analog or whatever works for you take notes on your phone or whatever so if you if not if when you see things that strike you or you have a thought you can just get it down and keep that door open so maybe in a couple months you look back and you have all these ideas and then you finally have some time like oh hey now i can go back but if you just let those things go by and don't note them down uh, whether it's a sketch or just a few sentences or whatever um, it's kind of a waste you, you need to just keep that door open for your own thoughts and 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 let those creative uh, give those creative impulses um, a place to be until you can circle back and develop them more fully. I, I, I think that that's really important. At least it has been for me. Hmm. Well, well, uh, thank you all. Uh, Spend a round of applause for our panel, please.
Wen. And thank you, Wen. Thank you, Eva. 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 Thank you, Eva.